Hello, and welcome to the Core Philosophy Podcast. This is episode 79. Is grad school right for me? With doctors Andre Thomas, Janaya Robison, and Giselle Wires. This is a panel discussion featuring three insightful professors. In this week's special conversation, I am finally responding to what has been a frequent listener suggestion for a podcast topic. I've gotten several messages about this topic. Please do something about graduate school. Talk about graduate school, its ins and outs, its pros and cons, all of that. So this is a no BS discussion on the Coral grad school decision that weighs so heavily on many of us. I'm thankfully past that stage in my career, but many of you are not. Sometimes we encounter this decision more than once in our careers. So I invited a group of experts on the topic, each with experience working with graduate programs as both a student and as professors. Doctors Andre Thomas, Janae Robison, and Giselle Wires each have graciously given of their time for this important discussion. We discuss these questions. Why graduate school? Why do it? Is it right for me? Is it worth the money? What do I look for in a grad school? And will, what will they be looking for in me? What, musical kind, what kind of musical chops do I need to have? And we don't always give enough credit to people who teach for 30 years in middle school. So is there a way to prop those people up? where they are, rather than entice them into leaving their job to get another degree? You're going to have to listen all the way to the end to hear Dr. Thomas's thoughts on this. Dr. Wires and Dr. Robison also give insightful pieces of advice about balancing motherhood and graduate school. So stay tuned all the way through this episode. Since this is a slightly longer episode than normal, I decided to keep it all in one episode just so that you don't lose any of your train of thought. And if that does mean, like I mentioned, listening in multiple sessions, the great thing about podcasts is that you can do that. It will pick up where you left off if you stop, but you're not going to want to miss any of the wisdom, especially as everybody gets loosened up towards the end. You're going to really want to stick around and listen to the whole conversation. But before I do, I'm going to keep the business really, really short vocevista.com forward slash Coralosophy, resonance imaging software for your Coral classroom that will blow your mind. I have on my YouTube channel, a virtual uh, school unit that I created to teach kids about resonance, but you can do it in person as well. I would check that out and you can get a 10% discount on that software uh, at that website. So check that out in my show notes as well. Sightreadingfactory.com, graphite publishing, Dot com, RyanMain.com for sheet music, for sight reading. This is huge. All Coralosophy ch- at checkout code. You guys have like a, a, a bounty of discounts that you can get when you listen to this show. And then of course, MyMusicFolders.com for the Resonance Singer's Mask, but also for folders and for all the other stuff that they sell. And MyQuirRobes.com for your choir robes. You can enter Coralosophy at checkout and get a discount. So that's all I'm going to say though. And then we're going to get right to this awesome panel discussion. Okay, everybody, I am here uh, with a group to discuss a very important topic today on the show, which is the decision-making process of graduate school for choral directors. So I'm here uh, with Dr. Andre Thomas, Dr. Giselle Wires, and Dr. Janaya Robison. And all of us will come to this topic with a different perspective Uh in our life, from our life experience, from our educational backgrounds and all those types of things, which is kind of the point. Uh, We want to have as many perspectives on this topic as we can. And so what I'd like to do first, if it's okay, is have everybody just go around and give some of their uh, their professional background, specifically as it relates to this topic, because all three of you are folks that work with grad students. And so I thought you might have uh, each a unique insight into this. So let's start with Dr. Robison. Tell us about you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So I'm the director of choral studies at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Conservatory and um, came to this, you know, place where, you know, truly I am absolutely living and breathing my dream job right now. But it started out, um, I think, as many of us did as um, aspiring to be a high school choir teacher. And I, I taught in the public schools in Iowa and Minnesota for four years after graduating from Luther College. And then um, I I also aspired to to be a professional singer. That was part of my my uh, plan as an undergrad and as a, a young singer was to sing professionally. And I never wanted to have to let that go. And so after after teaching for a while and realizing that it was pretty strenuous on my voice, I decided it was time to go 
to get a, a, a master's degree and did so in, in voice and conducting. And then um, after that was able to teach it at Luther college and eventually went, I, I need to get the terminal degree if I want to be able to do this, if I want to have a, a long lasting career in higher education. And so um, went to the university of Arizona for, for choral conducting. Um, it, it's interesting at the end of that, you know, I thought I, I'm going to go teach at a college. I'm going to have a tenure track job. And um, that's, you know, that's the dream. That's what happens. So that's just part of the process. Well, that happened at about 2008 where everything crashed and there were just very few jobs out there. And, you know, I was a finalist for a couple of them and never, you know, never found, you know, the, the, the right fit that worked for both of us. And so my husband, who's also a conductor, he and I took full-time church jobs, which we never intended to do, and then created our own nonprofit with a professional orchestra and choir, decided, you know, hey, we're just going to make our own jobs. And um, then through that, and I really honestly thought that teaching in higher ed was sort of not in the cards anymore, because if you deviate from that path, it's sometimes difficult to get back on. And um, it just sort of uh, the situation presented itself for then for me to teach again in, in higher ed. And I taught at Luther College for seven years and then now at UMKC. So, um, yeah, I, I do feel that I bring a unique perspective, having taught in higher ed, public schools, full time church and nonprofit work <laughs> alongside being a um, singer, too. So that's a long answer, but gives some context. OK, great. Dr. Wires, tell us about you. Great. Thank you, Chris, for this topic. I'm really looking forward to talking about it today. Uh, so I teach at University of Washington. I'm the chair of the voice and choral departments. Uh, we mostly teach the choral conducting and literature type courses, one music ed course a year, um, and supervise the voice area. And my background is actually interesting in that I didn't think I wanted to be a conductor when I first started in college. I was intended marine biology. So I ended up at University of California, Santa Cruz, and quite quickly realized that uh, my heart was with music and um, conducting in particular. I had a fabulous mentor, and I think that's a really important thing I'm sure we'll talk about today, who uh, was a female conductor, now a fine uh, opera conductor, actually, Nicole Paymal. Um, and she mentored me and really gave me great advice about grad school. So basically what she said was, if you need it, you should do it. And if you don't, for the track that you're on, you can figure it out just by being a professional in the field. But in my case, I was definitely set for teaching at a college. I didn't know the size of the school I wanted to necessarily be at. And I still feel surprised sometimes that I'm at a big one, but um, it's it's been a great ride for me. I did take time between all of my degrees and that's something also we might want to talk about is the pros and cons of whether to take those those couple of years in between or at least between the undergrad and the master's. So that's what I did. I took a couple of years before going to Westminster Choir College for my master's degree, a couple more years teaching as an adjunct professor in Portland. I had three adjunct jobs and I was driving on the freeway all, all the time freeway faculty, as they call us. I was also teaching voice privately, and I had a church job. And I did that for a few years, and I really sincerely wondered, do I need to get that doctorate? And it was after those couple years of pounding the pavement, seeing there was not stability, seeing that the pay was low, no benefits. Those are the kinds of things that really drove me to decide to get my uh, DMA at also University of Arizona. So. I think that for me, it was academically really fulfilling, and I, I loved the opportunities that I had for the doctorate, but I also was looking for a way to not do it. So I think that's a good thing to consider is you really, should, I think for the DMA, you need to do it because you need it, and otherwise maybe maybe skip it. Yeah. Dr. Thomas. Well, <laughs> considering how long ago this was, <laughs> uh, I, I am currently... Um, visiting uh, professor of conducting and conductor of the Camerata at Yale. Um, this is my second year. The first year was virtual. And I said, after one year of that, I will not do another virtual year. Uh, 
so we're in person and everything's totally different. Um, um, the choir I have has both community and students and no community members are allowed on campus. And so I'm revamping and creating a, a new job like I haven't done for over 40 years. <laughs> but uh, that's where I'm currently teaching. I'm emeritus professor at Florida State University where I taught for 35 years. And then before that, I was uh, assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin. So getting my degrees, um, I kind of feel like things work out the way they're supposed to work out and that there is some sort of, sort of guiding force in our lives that direct us to either certain people or certain places. And, and often they're not the places or the people that we think uh, or the jobs that we think are ideal. And I, I, you know, I used to tell my graduate students because they would all come to the door looking pitiful around, you know, the, the third year when it was time for job placements and they'd send out some applications and immediately they didn't, they didn't get the uh, uh, affirmation from the ideal job that they assumed was just their job. And I would have to say, I say to them, just wait, you'll be in the job that you're supposed to be in. So be careful about that. And so for me, uh, I taught public school, um, and I'm grateful for that because it was in that experience I learned how to teach. Um, it's, it's, you know, you can have as many methods classes as you can create, but there is nothing like being in front of real kids at a real time. They teach you how to teach, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I did a couple of years or so and went away to Northwestern University where I studied piano. Uh, I have a master's in piano and I studied conducting with a woman by the name of Margaret Hillis. And um, then I left and went back to do more teaching. And I was teaching and one day this, uh, one of my students, his name was Danny. Danny came in and said, Grandpop's coming to a concert, to our concert. And I, he wants to talk with you and I hope you'll you'll um, talk with him. Uh, he conducts a choir. They do a lot of hard music. I don't know how good they are, but they do a, hard, a lot of hard music. I said, well, sure, Danny, I'll talk with him. And so after the concert, uh, Danny said, well, uh, Mr. Thomas, here's my grandpa. His name is Harold Decker. And I said, oh, hi, Mr. Decker, how are you? And my world consisted only uh, about the teachers that were in Kansas, and particularly Wichita and a little bit to Shawnee. Outside of that, that's my whole world. So I didn't know who he was. And so he looked at me and he said, you know, um, have you thought about getting a doctorate? And I said, no. And he looked at me and he said, now, can you tell me honestly that you think you can do what you're doing at age 55? And I knew the amount of energy it took for me to to control the students and, and do what I needed to do. And I said, probably not. So he did one unusual thing. He flew me to Champaign and I went to see the University of Illinois. Concurrently, uh, I met the woman who was going to be my wife the next week I got back. So <laughs> we got married that following August. I went on the honeymoon and the uh, one week later, I took every exam the University of Illinois had and practically every course the University of Illinois had. But I wouldn't trade the experience at the University of Illinois or my wife under any circumstances. So uh, that's, you know, did I choose my graduate schools? I don't even know if I did. I don't even thought I had a plan. They just happened. Um, but when I talk to students now, uh, you know, I'm probably a little bit more direct about what their goals are and what schools fit them best. Um, because not every school is, is right for everyone. And you've got lots of choices in the United States where to go to school or in Europe if you decide to do that. Uh, it depends on what your goals and your aspirations are. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I noticed in all of your stories is that the common thread seems to be that uh, as we plan our life and our career, uh, it's uh, there's more to it than just the school. Uh, there's also, uh, as uh, as Andre, you just said, there's the life circumstances around those choices. There are, as Giselle said, uh, the idea of uh, measuring, do you need to be 
uh, to have that degree in order to do what you're doing, or are you just tossing that degree on the top as a feather in your cap kind of thing in order to be considered a professional, et cetera. Um, and in Jenea, your case, it's kind of this, uh, also this idea of, uh, you know, to what degree do I quote unquote identify as a singer versus a conductor versus a voice teacher or whatever. And so we all have to individually, uh, make those decisions. And so, uh, so let's jump off into this concept then, which is the, that in, in the choral profession, in our world, we are a very, uh, academia dominated field, uh, in a, in a different way than say, for example, the business department at a university, right? Because in that world, uh, the most of what is considered to be success happens outside of the classroom and whether or not you actually make it a business. Uh, whereas in our world, if you remove the school choir from whatever level from the entire choral profession, there stops being a profession like tomorrow, right? So we're, we're very dominated in that way. And so, uh, so to what degree do you guys see the issue of directors feeling pressured to that if they, if I don't get more degrees, no one will take me seriously in, or no one will, no, I, I won't get any kind of good job. A quick but important shout out to the supporters on Patreon. The producers from Patreon are Vasquez Academy of Music, John Warner, Ulrika Igrain Munoz Alarcon, Chandler Smith, David Kowalsik, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, and Stephen Kathy Kakachik. That group is growing over there and it is exciting to see it uh, just ballooning each month. And you can join over there as well for as little as $3 a month. That's patreon.com forward slash philosophy. Thanks, everybody. Well, I, I do think there is some concern there that is quite legitimate. I mean, I, I do think that it's competitive to be in our field and the field is saturated with DMAs, um, more DMAs than positions. Um, so I, I do think that that's worth um, worth considering. But I still think that the, the thrust of what these students should be thinking about is where do they want to be and uh, where is where is their passion lie and then use that degree sort of I, I would like to think of graduate school more as a home base it's a place that you you settle yourself but then you also are entrepreneurial and you're out there doing other things whether it be already publishing some of our students publish during their degree or presenting at conferences, composing, performing as a singer, um, having a church position, and some even doing uh, full-time teaching while also getting their degree. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky thing for sure. Yeah, any other thoughts on that, that question, the competitive nature of, especially like, excuse me, like uh, how you phrased over the, the saturation of DMAs in the profession. Is that something you guys deal with as a problem with your students? I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, two sides of the same coin. So in order to be able to be considered for most of the job postings in higher ed that you see, you do need to have the terminal degree. That's just the, the fact. Very few jobs would you ha not have that requirement. On the other hand, I, I, you know, there are so many folks with DMAs that then, yeah, the pool is so saturated that um, it's just wildly competitive. So I do like to, to speak to my students about um, as somehow becoming as diverse and marketable as you can. And so if I have a student who's done a lot of public school teaching, we're going to try to you know, build on that to make them marketable if they're a composer, if they're a singer. Um, but I, I think that, you know, what is true in the, the performing realm, um, where I remember being a young singer, I think maybe I was a first year undergrad, and the voice teacher saying, you know, we think that you have what it takes to do this professionally, but you have to want it more than anything else or else you shouldn't do it. And <laughs> I think that in a way, you know, that that serves for, for um a lot of our students. I will have students who come to me and they say, yeah, I think I want a DMA. I mean, it would be, it'd be great to maybe not have your job, but maybe if I could have like a second job somewhere and, um, or maybe, you know, and they, they're just sort of, um, they see it as just, I don't know what to do. So I'll take this as the next step. They don't realize that um, you, you could do this and not have to amass a, a lot of debt and take a lot of time away from your professional 
um, path. This, it, this shouldn't be, I'm just going to now check this box because I don't know what else to do. Um, yeah. And I do yeah. find that there are some some uh, prospective students who come to me thinking of it that way, um, and the ones who are really hungry, I can usually usually tell. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they in in general they usually say that well I'd like your job. Okay, that's <laughs> that's somebody I know who wants it. So. Yeah. Now, one thing I noticed that the. Even even that just reality of needing the terminal degree to get certain types of positions at, in higher ed uh, was less true 20 years ago mm-hmm. than it is now and was probably even less true 40 years ago. Uh, Dr. Thomas, you could probably uh, uh, speak, speak to that. And uh, and that's just math. You can't blame me for that. Uh, how, how, is, how have you seen that change over your lifetime? Well, I, you know, I, I really don't know. I, I think students pick a school and select a school based on who's there. I mean, mm-hmm. to be really quite honest, the other thing that they I think they base uh, their opinion about what school they're going to go to is what happens to their students. Do their students get jobs? And if you've built a program, if you build a program where, you know, Florida State for me was 95, 98% of all students were placed. Uh, That was, I felt a personal responsibility that that was part of my job to do. Uh, And so with that knowledge, they they knew that pretty much probably they're going to get a job because he's he's gonna make sure that certain things happen. Uh, Also, it's the kind of coursework that they take you know, looking at a looking at a young person coming in and go, oh, you really have a musical logical thrust. Okay, then you're going to take notation, and you're going to also take probably um, a, a two courses in in Renaissance music. And then uh, I have a series. Let's look at you, maybe doing a, an edition of Victoria, for instance, to get started. Uh, those are things that we all do, guiding our students, um, that they they become, you know, viable in the job market. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Edie Copley and I were talking recently in her master's program. She only takes students who have had public school experience. If they haven't had teaching experience, mm-hmm. she doesn't take them. Um, but Florida State, yes, that was true. Uh, we made a few exceptions. Um, to that, but for the most part, it was true that we we saw them. If you see you see somebody being successful doing what they're doing, more than likely they're going to be successful in, in the program. If you see somebody who's complaining every day about going to work, they probably are going to complain every day about going to class, and this complain when they don't get a job. So. Um, at Florida State, it was pretty easy for me to look and evaluate where the heads were of the students coming in. Um, and there's a very strong music education thrust. And so that, that creates a, a kind of student. Um, Yale, this is a different, completely different world. Um, almost none of the students, none of the current students, they had a student last year, who had some teaching experience. Oh, I take that back. We have a, a new young master student who has, came from Texas. Um, but most of them have dreams about their professional world. Um, and we don't really quite change that because they are in ensembles that are paid for. They, <laughs> they uh, if they get into SCOLA, they have uh, six or $7,000 per student to sing in SCOLA to do lots of early music and all other kinds of things, and they have their eye on the professional world. And of course, that's a different world and how to get into that world, because most of it is in Europe, uh, although we've been creating environments here. Um, But it's not the same as the full-time choir master job of, let's say, the Netherlands Radio Choir or the Netherlands Chamber Choir or, you know, those situations. They're agents, they come to master classes, they look at the students, hey, and then they they decide to hire. And so that's a different kind of student. Plus the Yale doctoral student 
does two years on campus, four years to prove themselves, and by the time they've proven themselves, six years later, they have the final degree. So that's a totally different kind of student than the student you say, you're going to stay here three years and you're not leaving until that dissertation is finished because I lived through that when I first started teaching at the University of Texas and that is no picnic. Um, and you'll probably get a lectureship until that terminal degree is finished. So that's totally different. So it's two different kinds of environments. Um, yeah. Yeah, right. that's that, that's interesting, and, and I, that yeah, completely different world. I, can, let's drill in on uh, the center of that a little bit. Uh, maybe starting with you, Giselle, of the the importance Andre was just talking about of the varying importance at different types of programs for prior teaching experience for having gotten certain jobs. We all know that there are some people who. Uh, you know, they come out at age 27 with a DMA and they've never taught and then they're teaching education courses, uh, you know, those types of things. It's rare, but it does happen. Uh, so how, how do you think of that issue of evaluating a, a prospective student based on real world experience, so to speak? Yeah, it's very important, basically, is the quick, the quick answer. Um, I, I don't think it always has to be public or private school K-12 teaching, although that is generally the, the track that people take. Mm -hmm. And it's a very valuable, valuable track, uh, invaluable. But uh, if somebody has had a major church position with one or two choirs, uh, worked with children's chorus, um, understands how to really improve the sound quickly, um, knows the repertoire, perhaps has a more of a historical bent if they're involved in church music and really interested in musicology, as Andre mentioned. I've also brought people into the program that have had community choir experience that is substantive and that whole nonprofit world of knowing how to engage adults or again, children. Um, so I do think that uh, Jeffrey, my colleague, uh, Jeffrey Bores and I, we are quite cautious to admit anyone who is going straight degree to, to degree. Yeah, how about perhaps they have had a lot of podium time. Hmm. And perhaps they already come with a trajectory in mind and they're really on fire. And I can think of some people in our field that are extremely successful. I won't name names because I don't want to embarrass anyone, but they've been successful and they did yeah. not do anything but those degrees, right? Pushing through and finishing with a trajectory and with a passion. But I think in most cases, people are really wise to have had that real world experience and it's, it will be harder to get a job without it. Yeah, absolutely. Janaya, thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I mean, and um, just in full disclosure, I mean, I'm the newest at doing <laughs> this type of job. So this is my first position having um, taught graduate students. And even when I was teaching at an exclusively undergraduate uh, or uh, institution, I, I think that I, I sort of created little mini graduate <laughs> students within, you know, ways for them to, to um, have some mentoring and um, internships and such. Um, I, I spend a lot of time with my prospective graduate students talking and flushing out what it is, is their, their goals, um, what's the dream job, how can we make that possible, and um, having the difficult conversations with people, letting them know that I see that you want to do this, I hear that's what you want to do, but I have to be realistic with you, you're not going to be able to attain that without taking some more time teaching in the public schools or, you know, getting a bigger high school job, getting your choirs to sing at a conference, maybe publishing something, presenting at a, um, at a workshop, um, and, and then come back to me after that. Um, because I do feel, as Andre was saying, um, the, in order for to, us to have successful programs, we do have to have a institutional record of being able to place our students, um, well, not place, but have them be able to earn jobs after they're finished. And so I could accept a, a ton of students and then they flood the market and none of them get jobs. And then our, our time being a, a really prestigious institution <laughs> is very limited. Um, plus, I just feel that there's a ethical responsibility that I have to make sure that um, there, there are people who have very lofty dreams and I, I don't honestly see them being able to achieve them without perhaps taking a look at doing this, this, and this. And so I, I have had 
conversations with folks saying, I, I don't think that this is the right place for you. And personally, I think that you need to do this professionally um, to be on that track. So I am very selective. I only have one DMA student right now. I happen to have seven masters, choral conductors. Um, I do feel that that, that graduate level is much um much more necessary just to be able to make your way professionally, even in the public schools. And so I'm more apt to accept master students. The last thing that I'll say about it, and I tell the students this, the way that I've configured the program is that all of the conductors have substantial autonomous podium time with assignments with their uh, ensembles at UMKC. And so um, I want to make sure that I'm taking on people that I want as colleagues and who will help to mm -hmm. strengthen and retain singers in the program. And if I feel like I can't work with them and they're not going to work well in that um that that doesn't that doesn't serve us either. And I I think that they understand too that it, it's not perhaps the best fit or, or maybe the right time for them. Yeah. Um, Andre, in the Florida state context and your many years there, that, that, that was always a pretty large program with a lot of, a lot of graduate students. Was that something that you guys kind of struggled to ever to make, maintain a balance or is it just so large that podium time was always ample to distribute because there were so many choirs and students in that program? How would you describe that? Well, I, we had a lot of students. That's number one. Um, the other, the other thing is that um, the other conducting faculty realized that we would all have assistance to every one of the choirs, so eight choirs or so. So those students were graduate students, and everybody allowed their graduate students to conduct on their concerts. Um, and with me, with uh, uh, the, the, the big choir, um, I made sure that each one of, them, one of them got some sort of orchestral choral experience on their tape. <laughs> so they, they were, you know, they had some experience, you know, with them conducting an orchestra and a chorus so people could see they could actually do that. Um, and I, I, I think it goes back to um, whether or not you're by yourself and uh, whether or not you have colleagues you know, um, and for me, having my colleagues, it, hey, it was wonderful. I, I could look at a student and go, okay, this one's going to be problematic. Really talented. Ego is way too big. So he better be, or she better be with me this fall because I don't want to put that student onto my colleague, one of my other colleagues to have to deal with. Okay, and if some of that molding and shaping had to be done, I'd rather that I do it, and it wouldn't be such a problem for my other colleagues. Now, some needed special attention from my other colleague Judy Bowers, and when, <laughs> and I knew for sure that she was going to come in with both feet. So they they soon learned that um, at Florida State, you can't play one choral colleague against another because they talk all the time. And not only do they talk all the time, but you may be in that office, you know, well, Dr. Bowers didn't understand this. Oh, she didn't. Come with me. Let's go over and talk to Dr. Bowers about that. That soon stops all of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and you would think at a master's and a doctoral level, they wouldn't play those kinds of games, but they do because they're people, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you say, okay. Um, and, and so I, I, I don't know. I, I think that um, giving them sufficient podium time, they got it. They had plenty of time. Um, I would say that the students here at Yale get an extensive amount of podium time. You know, because we have the repertory course that the first years conduct. So they're conducting that choir all, all year long. Um, and then we have the recital course for the second year people. And so they're conducting that choir. And then uh, some of them are assigned as uh, assistants, like my principal assistant uh, with the camarada will conduct something on the 
on the Camerata concert, maybe two things, or maybe, you know, um, what did I give last time? Oh, uh, the Stephen Paulus um, ship carols, you know, that student did, did them all, you know, with the chamber choir, that was fine. Um, and so if you have faculty that are willing to give their ensembles up, then it can happen. If you have faculty who feel like they need to always be on the podium all the time with their ensemble, and I don't have time for graduate students, then, then you, you can't, you know, you can't accommodate them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How does that play out in Washington, Giselle? So we have uh, usually around 10 to 12 grad students on campus um, at varying stages in their degrees, pretty much even between masters and DMAs. And maybe a couple that are heading out the door that are writing their dissertation, coming in a couple times a week to sing in chamber singers and use the library. And then we have seven choirs at the university and Jeffrey and I only conduct two of those plus Phyllis Birdwell conducts our gospel choir. And the rest of those choruses are completely run by the graduate students. And we usually pair them so that they work as a team. In addition, students are conducting the top choirs. Jeffrey and I step down from the podium and, and allow for that regular performance, including on tour, which is pretty exciting. If you can get the opportunity to get a little Europe performance under, under your cap. Um, I do think I, I want to address what uh, Andre was talking about. It seems like mentoring is such a, a beautiful and psychological thing that we can do for our students that graduate school can really afford that. So yes, graduate school is about access. It's about facilities and colleagues and, and all of that. But it is also about developing your profile professionally. Who are you really? What do you have to offer that's unique? And your personality, how do you engage with each other, with your, your fellow colleagues, what we call the cohort at, at UW, um, building that professional way of being and knowing what your weak spots are and places where you really need to, to look deeper and become more of a responsible person that can really go out and, and change people's lives because within five or 10 years, they're gonna be doing what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. One of the uh, one of the focuses I want to kind of shift us to now, because we've so far we've been talking mostly about from the perspective of the program itself and how it's structured. And, the, and this is important information. But let's kind of flip our imaginations now a little bit to the younger colleague who maybe is uh, jumping on Facebook to express the concern of how do I know if if graduate school is for me? How do I know? Uh, what type of program to look for? What do I, who do I ask? You know, I see this all the time uh, when I'm engaged in conversations online with younger folks. Uh, so, and again, this would be one of those ones where if you're inspired to just jump in and what advice do you give to that person who says, what do I look for? Uh, how do I decide when it's time? Those are the types of questions that I think people want to hear your thoughts on. I think that's kind of hard to answer. And the reason I think it's kind of hard to answer is because of this thing called the pandemic <laughs> that is drastically affecting coral positions all over the United States yep. at all yep. levels. So, uh, you know, I, I, you know, if we were talking pre COVID, there's one answer. Um, while we're going through this pandemic, that's another answer because, um, We've got to see how many programs survive, you know, or will we ever get well, you know? Um, so would you say that maybe it's time to be a little bit more cautious with pulling the trigger on that kind of an expense right now? Is that what you're? Well, I think, I think, you know, and, and it's amazing. We, we have here at Yale, the largest freshman class ever came in this year, which is like, wow. Okay. Um, we had a large graduate, you know, um, amount of auditionings for the program. And quite frankly, we took no doctoral students. Uh, we took uh, only three master's students out of all these kids who applied to come here. Um, the thing that is different is that 
you know, being accepted here, everything is paid for and it gives them two years to be someplace and everything be paid for for a while before they have to face the real world. Um, uh, at Florida State, that was not the case. And so um, you, you got to decide, you know, whether or not you want to take this on. And I mean, you, and, I, and I think you have to talk really realistically to them about this is the amount of money your assistantship is. Um, yes, your tuition is covered here, but there's this little thing called fees. You better look out for that, too. I mean, all, all the kinds of things. Yeah. Yeah. I remember getting my assistantship from Northwestern. And when I got it, I was like, wow, because it was the same as my first year salary teaching school. And I thought, wow, and I won't even tell you that royal big sum of thirteen thousand dollars, <laughs> um, but that's what I earned teaching public school, and that was my assistantship at Northwestern. But what I didn't know is that a whole lot of stuff had to be paid for out of that thirteen thousand dollars. Whereas by the sixth year that I taught at Florida State, okay. I was still paying off Northwestern for that master's degree. You know, the doctorate I owed nothing for. And the undergraduate, because I taught at schools that could qualify, I qualified most of what I owed away. But my, my master's degree, although it was a wonderful experience, was a whole lot of money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I would look at a kid and say, well, you know, maybe you can do some of the things you want to do in a summer master's program. And that way you can still keep your teaching job at the same time. And so I encourage many of them to do that. Uh, number one, they're better students because <laughs> they come in, you know, frustrated and tired after teaching a whole nine months. And then they're not interested in theory. They come in with this doesn't work, and this doesn't work, and this doesn't work. And what are some solutions? Which makes a very viable, I think, master's program. And so I would encourage most people to do that. Um, if they can get into a, a program that they're there for two years, that's great. You know, especially depending upon if they know exactly the track they're going to go on to. Um, but some of the master's students really love teaching. And they want to be right where they are. They just want to be better at it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. any, yeah, go ahead. Any other thoughts on this? Yeah. I mean, I, I get um, folks who ask me questions about, is it, is this the right time? Should I do a summer master's program? Should I, you know, resign my teaching job, um, go for two years, or is there a way I can work something out with my school district? And there have been, uh, colleagues that I've seen that they're they're well established in their program the school district doesn't want to lose them so they're able to to navigate something where they can pursue a graduate degree um, close to where they're located um, I think that I, I'd feel terribly remiss if I didn't mention that many um, women especially but also men come to me to talk about well how do I do this if I want to have a family and <laughs> because you know that's really a lot of the conversation and for for those of us, I think other than our, um, as opposed to our applied colleagues, you know, who are Obro professor and you can just go straight through those degrees and you're fine. It seems, I, I see the most successful conductors usually are, you teach for a while, you go get more schooling, you teach for more, you go get more schooling. And so we have this sort of stop and start and you might not be finished until you're 35. And so they're starting to think, how do I navigate having a family? I, I am proud of the fact that maybe my husband and I were just a little um, cuckoo during our times for graduate degrees, but we had our first daughter during our master's, second child was uh, when I was teaching uh, as, a, as a lecturer, and then third child was during the DMA um, uh, coursework at University of Arizona. And I was actually part of a cohort of graduate conductors that it was, it was like a, um, I don't know, it was like a virus. We were all having kids at the same time as getting our doctoral degrees. Because and, the degree. Yeah. And it just, it, it worked just fine. And so um, I know that that, that plays into the conversation as well. And, um, and people are very cautious about the amount of debt that they're taking on. I think it's, 
it's different now than it even was 15 years ago when I started at the University of Arizona as a DMA student. Um, so I, I think the old adage is, is true that especially for the doctoral degree, you should not be going if you have to pay. You know, it, you need to find a place where you can at least get tuition, remission, if not an assistantship, unless your circumstances allow you to not be concerned about that. And there are some students that I noticed um, for whom that isn't that isn't an issue. And some international students have support from their home countries. Um, but that I, I still would encourage, especially the DMA student to, to make sure that they have funding. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Does everyone else agree with that kind of blanket statement that if you shouldn't be paying for a doctorate, it, it might not be worth it? <laughs> well, you know what? I would say um, every individual is different. And um, I've had students who have come that first year who didn't get an assistantship, but stayed that first year. And because they stayed the wow. next year, they got the assistantship. Mm -hmm. um, some of them went on to be heads of the department, but, um, you know, because you just never know. Sometimes you, you the balance doesn't quite work right. Um, and I also think it's crucial that if you're a doctoral student, don't come to campus without your spouse. Because I want to be able to talk to your spouse at the same time. And your spouse really needs to see the environment and what's going on there. Um, and, and, and I find that the students, more so than anybody, take care of all of that. They answer all those questions about now, how was child care here, 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 and here? Yeah. You know, and generally, um, it doesn't matter whether or not it, it's a woman that's the spouse or a man that's a spouse. It's equal questions like, you know, how can I work here? What's, what's available for me here? Uh, I think those are real serious questions that you have to ask. Um, you know, and, and that it has to be uh, a, a couple. I mean, I, that sounds old fashioned, I know. Um, I don't care what kind of couple, but it's got to be a couple. If they're, if they're in a relationship with somebody and it's a permanent relationship, um, they need to be a part of this decision because this is a big commitment that they're making at this point in time. I mean, it's like moving somewhere for a job, even though it's it's school, but it's you're making a commitment for several years to be in a place. And yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Um, any other uh, any other thoughts on just again that that I, the core question, which is well, actually, you know what? Let's flip it. You you are now in your roles evaluating these these candidates, right? That are coming in, so they're uh, they're applying to to be there, and let's say. Uh, you've got this wide range of, uh, I've worked before, I've never taught before, um, I've done some church choir, you, you have the whole, uh, the whole gamut. What, what are the things that each of you look for in the ideal, and let's just say master student? What, what is the ideal master student in your minds? Finish up the, the last question that I, I do think that yeah. considering family and, and the uh, physical time clock for, for women is really important. And I would also like to share that I felt that I needed to get all my degrees before I started a family. And I look back now and I see how graduate school can be a supportive place for you to start that family sooner. And especially if you want to have more than one child, I have one and I'm thrilled with one. But I do think that I, I waited quite a long time. So um, look for a school where you have the whole family on board. If you already have kids, the school district is supportive. The cost of living is workable. Um, but but I also consider the fact that you could have children during grad school, as, as Janae was saying. I think in terms of a, a prospective master's student, in that case, they may not decide. It, it's not necessary for them to become professors someday, perhaps. Or perhaps they do want that, and perhaps they don't know yet. And that is all completely understandable that they may come in with some teaching. Um, they may really sincerely come to grad school because they want to learn. <laughs> and that is an okay thing. 
I do think it's important for them to, to have an idea of what they want to learn so that, again, we can help them with that professional profile and getting those jobs in the future. Um, but for me, it's about musical skill. It's about having some experience on the podium, some ability to conduct already, some score study under their belt, some piano under their belt. Whereas we're, when we're looking at the DMA, we're looking a lot more at, as, as you go about what's the research profile? What is the dissertation going to be? Where are they going to work? How big of a university do they want to be at if they're choosing that track? So it's a little bit of a different kind of, of profile. Great. Anybody else have kind of a rubric in their mind that they think about this with? Well, I think if interacting with the student, I discover that they are coming to graduate school to teach the faculty. That's the first bulb that comes in my ear. And somehow or another, that candidate keeps going further back in the list in my mind. Um, if they are eager to learn, and they've, they've shown evidence of being eager to learn in their own programs, you know, you go, okay, I think this is, this is a good fit for all of us. You want to learn, you're talented, you're hardworking, you know, it's our job. I had the flexibility, have, even though it was a PhD program, there was one required course, and then I could mold their entire curriculum around their interest. You know, and so, you know, that gave me plenty of flexibility as far as when the student came in, rather than this whole array of classes that you have to take. Now, if some of them came in like I came in, either coming off of honeymoon and, and never looking at a book before going in, there are probably remedial courses they're going to have to take. You know, um, here at Yale, there are no remedial courses. You cannot come unless <laughs> you have passed. Uh, we have a test for the doctoral people that only 1% pass. So, um, we can't even consider any kind of assistantship unless the doctoral candidate has passed that exam in theory, history, and musicology. And it's a tough exam. And their writing has been approved. You know, I can't tell you how much time I sit around my table with doctoral dissertations, like one student from 5.30 in the afternoon to 5.30 in the morning saying, you will write this first chapter before you get off of my table. And... You know, but, but that's not the case at Yale. Okay. What about uh, what about musical? No, Jenea, did you have something to add? No, I I, I was gonna say that um, just to, uh, thinking about my own master's program, my I would um, went to the University of New Mexico and studied with uh, Bradley Ellingbow and uh, was attracted to that program because I could do a master's in voice and in conducting at the same time, and. Um, and also because, you know, I, it was actually I was sitting around a table at a, a ACDA conference in Chicago in, I guess it must have been 1999. And um, Tim Peter was there and Anton Armstrong was there. And we were talking about where should you go to grad school? And they said, let us introduce you to Brad Ellingbow over here. And it was Anton who, who knew Brad Ellingbow. And my husband and I were both looking for a program to, to study. And um, we had breakfast with Brad the next day. And we just, the, the environment and the personalities really clicked. And um, since then, I mean, that was 2002 that we graduated. Brad, I can say, is one of the most um, effective uh, advocates for his students. And I think that, you know, finding a partnership that even if you think I need to go to X school and study with this person and you have that interview audition and it just doesn't seem to click, it's really hard, I think, for it to click later on as well. I mean, I think you kind of know. And so I think that students need to understand that despite the fact that it not, might not be your number one pick of a graduate school that you want to go to, if you find a situation where that teacher um, has similar interests and it just, it, it you sense that it, it feels right, that then that person can be a better advocate for you later. And I, I don't know that I was ever expressly told that you need to find someone who can be an advocate for you. Um, and that that's, that's really the, the first step to getting your foot in the door for so many things. Yeah, that's absolutely true. And, and I, I'm wondering, we haven't, one thing we haven't really discussed yet in this process is musical aptitude. How do you guys evaluate that? 
So in other words, if I'm, if I'm a young person thinking, am I ready for grad school? What kind of music stuff, uh, considering these are music programs, do I need to be able to do uh, in, in your various worlds? So at University of Washington, we have a pre-screen, which is uh, conducting video that is sent in way early, usually in the fall. And then we invite, invite usually 12 students to campus, maybe 13, um, over a two-day period where they're able to be sitting in all of our classes as well as auditioning, um, getting to know the cohort, spending social time with them, and a private interview with both Dr. Boris and myself. And what we look for past that first video, I suppose I, I could clarify with that, it's we're looking for personality, we're looking for energy, we're looking for are they actually improving the sound? What's the gesture looking like? Ironically, the gesture is not doesn't need to be as polished as sort of that that drive and that connection with the choir. If we can really see that that person can um, involve the students, that they're singing and demonstrating and, and not just talking through rehearsal, um, and that they have a vision in their head of how they want that music to sound, that's a lot more important than even how the gesture is looking initially. And then when they come to campus, we listen to them sing a solo and we listen to them play the piano, whatever level they feel comfortable doing. <laughs> and then they have, of course, the, the on-campus audition with chamber singers. Okay. Well, I think it's a combination of things uh, because um, in both places, there was the video uh, screening, both at Florida State and at Yale. Uh, there was a video a screening. And then those candidates that are decided on Oh my goodness, um, there are all kinds of things. Uh, this past year for these candidates coming in, uh, we tested their hearing acuity um, and uh, they did things like uh, play a Bach chorale and ask them to write it. And you know, that's, can you retain that? Um, you know, um, incredible dissonant sight reading to do to see what their musical aptitudes are. Um, can you hear inversions in chords? Uh, what is your literature? Um, um, can you recognize these pieces that we're talking about? You know, that kind of thing. Um, at Florida State, it was different. And um, again, the same kind of thing. You know, how, how does the ear work? Um, and also thinking about sometimes a student can buy an ensemble and make a tape. And sometimes you see them with real kids, with real, <laughs> real, and, and you know, maybe it's just because I'm an old man that dotes on being a, a, a daddy, but I, I look at, you know, are they making a difference here in these kids' lives as they're working with them, you know? And maybe this choir is not yet ready to appear at a national conference, but boy, they're doing some pretty good work here. And then, and what are the things that we can offer them? You know, and we have to say, yeah, I'm head of the department, but you're not coming to this school just to be with me. Okay? So you need to have that in your mind because I may send you every place to get everything that you need to help bring that composite together for you, which will be different from somebody else. So yeah, mu musical aptitude is crucial. You know? And sometimes it, some elements you go, you know, maybe this can be taught, but then you go, this probably can't be taught. If they're actually in a situation where they really can't hear anything, it probably is not going to be taught, you know? Um, if there, if there are things that they don't know from a musicological standpoint, that can be taught. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, and, and as far as the gesture, I, I agree, Giselle. I look at the gesture and go, okay, first of all, are they getting any results from that gesture? Yeah, because I'm, I'm of the philosophy that <laughs> if the gesture actually means something and there's a good result, keep it, okay? If you're not getting anything from it, get rid of it. It's a habit, okay? So 
you know, I'm, I'm looking at that going, okay, I, 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 I get that. Um, and I think we have to give them, you know, a latitude of, of experiences. Mm -hmm. I remember when I went to Northwestern, well, no, my first year of teaching at the University of Texas at Austin. You know, you finish a doctoral program, you go in and you're teaching, and your best friend who comes from your graduate days, and I keep telling them all, you know, Anton Armstrong is my best friend, and we have been friends for 43 years, 44 years, 43 years. But anyway, um, he called and he says, what are you working on? <laughs> And I had to look at him and say, I'm working on New York, New York, and, uh, <laughs> and, and rock with you. <laughs> you know, I just finished preparing the Poulenc, and I'm going, yeah, well, that's not my life. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what's going on in my life, you know. But yeah. then, thank goodness, <laughs> then uh, major works, you know, I do five or four or five a year or six a year. That's a whole different ball game than it was in the beginning. But yeah, it, it was that. And so some of those things you have to go, well, you, you haven't had a whole lot of experience doing those major works, you know? And yeah, we can help you get those experiences. Um, I will have to say that Harold didn't do much for New York, New York for me. Um, <laughs> that didn't quite happen. That's funny. That's funny. Uh, so let, I actually have something that you just touched on, Andre, and that that I want to kind of make our final topic. But Gis uh, I, we heard from Giselle already. Jenea, do you have any things to add about the the screening process, in your opinion, yeah. for the students? Yeah, I mean, ours are, is very similar to what um, everyone has um, spoken about, being able to demonstrate musical aptitude in a pre-screening video. Um, Part of my process is also um, when they're invited to campus that the the conducting audition is also it's it's audition and part master class. So I want to see is this student teachable? Um, does it does it work well? This this individual and I um, and uh, yes, it, is what they're doing on the podium affecting the sound? Because I've seen beautiful gestural conductors and they seem to be conducting completely with. Um, auditory blinders on. <laughs> um, and, and, and I think one of the, the biggest uh, important factors is them having connection with the cohort to see, is this a, an environment, a group of individuals with whom I, I click? Um, and I've had some come in who, um, this person maybe has a, a larger ego and you realize this isn't going to be a really good fit. Um, and so I don't know how I would, you know, be responsible to these other students to bring in someone who, thinks that they're a really big fish. That's that's a tough thing. The other thing is I think some students don't realize that when you list people who are your references in your um, in your uh, application materials that we really will call and talk to these people about, tell me, I noticed this, what do you think? Is this something that, has this been a problem? The, oh yeah, I mean, I tried for two years to work that out and I can't. Um, I'd be curious to see if you can. <laughs> and, um, but also that then I know that this person had connection with this other person or this other group. I may just cold call someone who's not on your list as well to see, you know, um, because it is that competitive to, to get into these programs. But yeah, I think the masterclass score identification, mostly I don't want to trip up my the perspective the auditionees I want to see how their minds work um so I want to see them look at a full score and tell me what it is that you see what you know and um just to hear their process but yeah. sight reading and stuff never goes away right, right. <laughs> so, yeah right. playing open score never goes away yeah my yeah I, I feel I feel like I look back to that audition for my master's in conducting and the just the boot camp of trying to sight read Bach while, but in German and doing Hindemith exercises and trying to play a bird mass while singing one of the parts and playing the other parts and just this ridiculous stuff. Uh, and and it, it's one of those things that you would never be asked to do in real life. <laughs> Not really, but it's a, just a, a way to see how your, how your musical mind works, I suppose. So um, la the last topic, and as we, you guys have been uh, gracious with your time already, but one of the things that Andre kind of touched on in his response was he, you mentioned the, uh, the person who submits the video where maybe they hired a choir or whatever uh, versus, versus submitting a video of you working with your you know, ninth graders. 
Um, those are two completely different skill sets in so many ways uh, where I, I would even make the argument that one could become an expert or a master conductor of a choir while not really ever becoming an expert or a master teacher of young people. Uh, those are not necessarily the same, like you, there's overlap in some of those skills, but, uh, but you could be an excellent teacher of young people um, who might not ever make it into a doctoral program in conducting because maybe your musical chops aren't what other people's are, but there's psychological skills there, there's motivational skills there, there's the ability to connect. And so uh, reflection then on, on the difference between, uh, you know, the, the idea that a degree can conf uh, is a place to earn uh, an education, but expertise in different areas in our choral world might look a lot different for a lot of different people. Uh, you could be an expert at teaching young people, but maybe not uh, ready to conduct a professional choir, et cetera. Uh, those are two different things. So uh, how do you all see the role of the degrees that you help people earn uh, in, in that idea of, you know, that expertise can look different in different ways for different people? Well, I think you just said it. <laughs> it's how we view it, uh, basically. And it, it, it's also what what is in my head. I, you know, I, I have a student who got um, the summer master's program was her program. And she's completing her 38 year. And I mean, I venture to say every time her group has sung at a national conference, people go, are those really middle school kids? It's amazing. She's amazing, right? And I think that sometimes um, we encourage people just, you know, we don't give enough credit to people who are teaching in those cir circumstances. And if we keep building them up, rather than trying to entice them to get a, another degree, you know, because they may not be as successful as they have been where they are. And, and we know where they are. And, and my goal is constantly is building her up because she's phenomenal um, at, at what she does. And she's done it for, you know, those are lifelong teachers. You know, I think of people like Sally Schott in Texas. She's been, was around forever. She was, she was there. She was an excellent high school teacher, you know. Fantastic. Yes, could she do a college program? Yes. But she finds that her place where she fits is there. And I think that's another part of our job is encouraging people who are doing good work to continue doing good work. And if they come in and say, you know, at this point in my life, I need to make a change, that's different. Yeah, absolutely. Other, other thoughts on this question? I, I really agree that mentoring is key here and that what we do when they come in or even before they get there is that we're helping them to know their identity and what they're really good at. And so their video, their first pre-screen video might be with a choir that's not as great, but you can see that they have uh, the ability to connect and the ability to inspire and the ability to improve the sound to the level that's possible with that particular group. So when I'm looking at those pre-screens, I'm not really listening to the sound except to see how it's changing and developing. And then when that student comes into the program, I'm trying to get a really clear sense of who they are, what is their passion, where are they strongest, and how can I help them become even stronger? And I would also put in one uh, caveat about the people who hire for uh, their, their pre-screen they will write that in their statement. We usually ask them to submit statements about the video and who is the group. And sometimes it's either COVID related that they, they had to, or perhaps um, they really felt like they were in a program, let's say teaching elementary kids where they might not be able to get enough of a change in the sound quickly enough in that 20 minutes to demonstrate that they, that they can teach. And so it's not always um, uh, something that I would cancel them for right off. Um, and if they want to conduct professional choir, that is what they're going to need to have is a hired group. But again, are they changing the sound? Are they impacting and creating an interpretation with the people that they have in front of them? Yeah, good. Janaya, thoughts on this? 
Yeah, I I'm, and I haven't done this as long, but I know that the the few times that I've been through this audition and pre screening process, I have seen people, and I think it is mostly COVID related that they have choirs that they've hired friends in a metropolitan area, and you can tell these all sing for professional choirs and they're coming together and it's really beautiful. Um, but yes, I, I would say then I, that's sitting right alongside a video by a teacher who's in a, um, you know, a more, uh, I, it's not a established high school program and maybe it's ninth and 10th graders and you might have two tenors and basses and the rest are sopranos and altos. And there's some really glorious work that I see happening and change in the sound and their pacing and just um, process. It's, it's brilliant. Um, I, I, I think that part of what um, there was something that Andre said, and I can't remember why I thought this would be important to, <laughs> to mention, <laughs> I can't remember. but that I, you know, um, I, I taught at a, a liberal arts college for, for seven years and very much uh, our ideal there is to, to be aspiring to these lofty sort of philosophical goals. And that's excellent. But sometimes I felt like we need to dig in more to pragmatic ideas. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we, we did last year when we're just trying to pivot and create meaningful and applicable content <laughs> in our classes was to have in, in place of a, uh, physical conducting seminar. And once we tried to do seco recitative on Zoom and whatever, you know, it just doesn't work very well. We thought, you know, let's look at things like Stephen Seek's book, Teaching with Respect. Let's talk about that. You know, and last week, let's have a 30 minute time during this class period to talk about how did recruitment work? What did you see work? What didn't work well? Let's do some compression planning on vision for this year. And just things that I think are enormously beneficial skills for them to have as future um, leaders in programs, doctoral students, master students. And so I, I like to see that pragmatic. This, this is what I've been doing. I've been teaching eighth grade for the last five years. Here's my choir. You know, um, we're not doing bird, but, you know, look at us rock some SAB <laughs> literature right now. <laughs> so, right. yeah, I say be, be authentic. Don't apologize for that. Don't try and make yourself something you're not in order to achieve some sort of standard that you think we want at this level. Um, yeah. 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 I, I, in my world, have spending most of my life working with high school age singers. And then most of that time also working with an adult professional group. I think about this a lot because this is kind of a pet, a pet topic for me because a lot of, I take a lot more pride in the sound building that I do with my high school kids than I do with the grownups mm -hmm. because I taught them how to do that. I, I didn't teach the grownups how to do that. They showed up with their years of voice lessons and their years of degrees and, all those things, someone else taught them to do those things. And I just get to wave my arms around. It's a completely different uh, thing. And so I think that's why my, the example that Andre used of that middle school teacher who's been getting kids or getting audiences to say, those are middle schoolers. Like th to me, that is a form of expertise that we should hold like up really high because if anyone's worked with middle schoolers, that's hard. Like that's really, really hard uh, to get that to happen. So I, I love that as kind of like a closing thought uh, for what we've been talking about. Because ultimately when someone's trying to decide if they need to do graduate school, they also kind of have to think, as you all said, kind of at the beginning, is it, what are your goals? Like, are, are your goals to, uh, you know, to teach in higher ed, at which point that's a very different thing. And, and ultimately I think you guys would all agree and, and feel free to add final thoughts, but that uh, that there, depending on what your goals are, there's a lot of ways that a person could be, feel validated and feel like they have become, you know, had a successful career. Any closing closing thoughts? I would just close by saying that a master's or a doctorate it takes time, but it also gives you time. It it it, it creates again that home base and that place where you can um, develop yourself professionally and be mentored and, and be with a cohort and have a choir. And so if you're looking at your future and thinking about your goals and you think that that would be a value and that it's worth the, the time or the money, um, it could be kind of an oasis, a, a really precious, special kind of, of time for you um, that makes all the difference. But 
you also might realize that that you don't need it and and that's you know what the, I, I love this conversation Chris I really appreciate you bringing me on and I've, I've learned a lot from Danae and, and Andre as well great Anybody? I would I, I'll have to leave the last word to Andre, so I'll go next. <laughs> I, I think that, um, yeah, I think sometimes what scares me is when I hear people come to me and they say, I think I'm just ready for the next step. Well, and with no sort of idea of what that means on the, on the, in the future with that. And, you know, a lot of times I'll get people to just kind of flush out what, what does that actually mean? But I, I agree. This really does, um, like Giselle said, it takes time, but it does give you time. If your life circumstances can afford, um, and that's financial, personal, everything, the time to take a moment and just focus on you and your professional development, your musical development, your um, who you are as a conductor, as an educator, as a musician, um, take it. I mean, it's, it's absolutely, absolutely worth it. And um, to be able to have those relationships that you, you build on and truly, I, um, I think we're the, the same as, as Andre mentioned, the forming lifelong friendships with people who, become your best friends because this is a this is a process that strips you down to your very core where i feel like you don't really feel like you know so little as when you have finally learned a lot i mean it's the further you get in the doctorate the further you the more that you realize you don't know anything and that can be very scary for people and very vulnerable and so um i think if you, if you can stomach that and know that that's going to be part of it you're going to feel like an imposter you're going to feel like you don't know anything and that's okay and that's part of this sort of baptism by fire <laughs> but on the other side of it is i think really a, a beautiful experience Right. All right. Close us out with some wisdom, Dr. Thomas. I sure wish I could because <laughs> my colleagues have said it all. <laughs> I, I really think so. I think they have they they've hit it right on on, on the head um, that it's an opportunity and it's an opportunity for growth. And if that's in your mind that you want to grow, then it's time to come back to school. If it's in your mind that you want this degree you know, for the prestige of the degree, it is not the time. And it's not the time to, to run away and get a degree because you're not doing a good job of what you're doing now. So I just want to get out of here and I'll get a doctorate and then I'll teach people how to teach. Yeah. You know, no, that's, that's, that's not, that's, that's not the reason, but it is to grow and to learn. And, and as they, and as I said to all of my former students, these will be your colleagues for the rest of your life. They will be the people that you'll constantly call on, you know, uh, because they have you spent three years with them, you know, and they are your colleagues. And it's nice to have colleagues. And it's also, you know, nice to know that you can get along with people, you know, um, because the, the thing I get every time on a job application, people will call me and say, what kind of colleague will this person be? Well, they learned that in graduate school. That's where you really learn what kind of colleague these you know, people are. And so that's part of your learning experience just as much as your musical experience. That's great. Well, this was wonderful, you guys. Thank you so much for spending some of your afternoon with me and I, I think this is going to be very helpful for people so I appreciate it I hope so. thank you so much as always for sticking around to the end if you made it this far into a long episode you are probably one of the diehards I appreciate you thank you so much the biggest things that you can do to help the show are to help other people find it so that's liking sharing commenting interacting with the content going on core philosophers and leaving a question or a comment, uh, leaving a rating in the Apple podcast app. If you use Apple, uh, there's just basically any, any way you reach out to me helps in ways that you cannot possibly imagine. Uh, so thank you so much for the, doing that. And of course you can join the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash core uh, to join that supporters community over there. Thanks everybody. Have a good day. <laughs>